Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Uh, welcome to All Things LGBTQ. Uh, I know you've, you're a friend of ours, you've been on before. And so welcome to the show again. And uh, Brenta Churchill is running for District Franklin 6. Um, and could you tell us what area that's in so people will know? Sure, it's the uh, uh, southeast corner of Franklin County. Uh, I call it uh, delightfully the BFF, which is Bakersfield, Fairfield, and Fletcher. Uh, it's uh, uh, largely rural, a uh, lot of dirt roads, and a great farming uh, community overall. And when you ran, did you think, oh, this is going to be a breeze, or were you really worried about whether you were <clears throat> elected? And uh, and now you're the you are the Democratic. Um, candidate from that area? I am. I didn't have an opponent in the Democratic primary, so that made it a little easier to not have to uh, spend a huge amount of time worrying about whether I'd get a primary vote. Um, my only opponent uh, is the incumbent uh, representative, uh, and he won last time because he had no opponents at all, so uh, we're going to put up a little bit of a fight uh, on this one. And I'm hoping to uh, hoping to carry the district in November. And how is your how's been how has your response been in in your neighborhood? Um, do you have a lot? I would of have to say, there? yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'd have to say that there's been a lot of support in Bakersfield. Even Republicans have told me they're voting for me. Uh, my my neighbor, who's a dyed in the wool Republican, said, "I voted for you in the primary. I'm going to vote for you in the election." And he said, "I want you to." carry a honest message into Montpelier. So I figured that was a, that was a mandate uh, uh, from my neighbor, which, which made me feel really good. Um, I did do well in the primary bees, which is not a primary, but kind of like a straw vote. Uh, and I, I, a lot of Democrats did turn out uh, in Bakersfield and I got a, I got some write-ins from Republicans, which was surprising. Um, so I'm I'm pleased to pleased to say that um, <clears throat> I get to represent the Democratic Party uh, in in November. So, uh, but yeah, it's been good so far. And and what about your opponent? Um, are your values kind of really? I mean, you know, what are you bringing to this that he hasn't or or? Thanks. That's that, that too. Yeah, have. yeah. Um, one of the things that my opponent has done is uh, voted pretty much in lockstep with Governor Scott. So uh, he voted uh, and was with all the vetoes that the governor um, uh, wrote. The most important one that he voted against was a woman's right to choose what uh, was uh, an amendment uh, number five, but now it's Article 22. Uh, he uh, voted against it three times. And then in the last one, he might've realized that he was headed to, headed to trouble because he abstained. Uh, from the vote, and I, I think that's the same as voting no. Um, he didn't. Uh, he chose not to, not to vote uh, at all. Um, so I'm kind of glad that he did uh, that because I think it's easy to talk about the issues. Another one is the, uh, the bottle bill. Uh, as a merchant, he voted uh, against it, um, and with all due respect, I think most people would rather have clean highways and pay a nickel. Um, on an initial deposit, uh, bottle bill obtain provisions to to pick up a lot of uh, the containers that are not uh, no uh, do not have deposits on them right now. It raised it to ten cents to help fund it, uh, and of course uh, he voted no, and it didn't pass. But I feel confident that if we have a have a majority uh, in the House in the Senate. Uh, we'll be able to get that passed. So that, that from an environmental standpoint is very important. 
uh, if there was a tax credit uh, involved, uh, he voted no uh, for it. Uh, child tax credit for uh, my families it brought a lot of people, uh, brought their kids out of uh, 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 unfortunate or, or less funded uh, scenario. And um, I think the child tax credit was an important bill. Uh, fortunately, it did pass uh, with a majority of the House and the Senate. So. These are good things that uh, I think I would have supported, uh, but he did not. So basically his voting record may, may be um, what uh, helps me the most. Um, I certainly had, uh, I'm sorry, say again. How are you reaching your neighbors and, and um, uh, letting them know about your platform? Have you gone to schools or do you knock house uh, house? Do you have help? Yeah, that, that's that's also a good question. One of the things that um, I think I've been fairly relaxed on is getting out a lot. I've been to public functions. I've been to some ice cream socials and concerts. Uh, I uh, I did a kickoff at the Fairfield Community Center uh, back in uh, in May, and uh, uh, basically been circulating among people and, and getting out to uh, meetings. Uh, and talking with people. I haven't been to schools yet. We have a, a great school district of one school. Uh, uh, Bakersfield Elementary is, is um, uh, the school in town and uh, they just started school again. So haven't been doing much with the schools. Fairfield has um, Fairfield Center School. And I think I'll have strong support with the teachers. I'm very supportive. Uh, of, of education and uh, uh, public education is a cornerstone for our kids and, and growing up. And it's, it's really a, a anchor in our community. So uh, we've got Fletcher Elementary too. So I've got three, three elementary schools that uh, I'll be visiting at some point in time. Hope to have some meetings with farmers um, in the near future. Well, I'm going to see if I can get a forum together where myself and the Senate candidates um, can go and talk to talk to the farmers. Um, I have some friends who uh, work uh, for the state that are helping out uh, with the farmers crowds. And I've got a couple of good allies, including some endorsements from from people who are farmers. So I'm I'm, uh, I'm fortunate to know a lot of people. That's been a good thing for me. Yeah. Um and is, is your opponent attacking you on any levels or the, is it just, or is it a smooth kind of, you know, let's be nice to each other kind of campaign? I, I think we both adopted uh, the, the let's be nice, take the high road thing. Um, he haven't, hasn't said anything. I haven't seen anything in the press yet. Um, I, I have seen some things. Um, no, really, I haven't. I, I apologize. I haven't seen anything and we're, we're going to be positive. I got some uh, pieces going into Front Porch Forum and uh, social media this week. Um, we're going to ramp up. Uh, my endorsements are, are many, including Christine Hallquist and uh, um, the former principal of Fairfield Center School is a strong advocate for me as well. Um, she's gone on to nursing. Uh, she left a high pressure job to go into a, a very... Okay. Yeah, a, a, another high pressure job. So um, I'm, she's doing well and thriving, which is nice. I think the school has its own pressures, uh, which it has been a, uh, something that she, she endured uh, and did well and, and then just decided that she wanted to uh, uh, take off in a different direction. That's okay. Um, I've got a farmer or two that are going to do it for me. Um, I've got. Uh, uh, a Republican that's actually going to uh, endorse me, and uh, I've got uh, some community leaders, including Craig Mitchell, uh, who said he would uh, put out an endorsement for me, which is great. So I'm going to work on those. I'm going to try to get those uh, out this out the door this week. Um, you follow my webpage, uh, which is uh, votebrendachurchill.com. Yeah. Um, you can see it. You can see them there. Uh, we'll also try to um, make some splashy flashy things on the um, other media on social media as well. So I've got Any some bumper? great folks that work with me. Any bumper stickers? 
I have little three by five bumper stickers. I wanted unobtrusive. I wanted things that I could stick on uh, places and uh, they actually stand out. And, uh, I'll send you a picture if you want to use it to yeah. uh, show my campaign sign. Uh, my campaign signs, um, a little artist uh, added some, um, uh, some color uh, to it by putting some swoosh on the mountains uh, in orange and yellow and uh, some along the ground. So they, they got really pretty really quick and they're very popular. So I hope to have them out. I told people, let's put them out after Labor Day. People are really tired of looking at all the primary side. Yeah. Um, even after the primary, I, I took them and uh, I put up a couple in strategic places. So where they get a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we're, we're currently uh, offering signage uh, in my district. If, if you make a five dollar contribution, you'll get a sign. So it's a nice way to do it. So Brenda, on 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 a final note, did you wake up some morning and say, "Oh, I'm going to get into politics," or because I, I know you were an activist first, I think, and you you got into, uh, I believe, politics through activism. Um. And so, am I right about that? Was it a progress? Was it progressive for you? And then you thought, well, I can really do some good here in the legislature because I know you were, like I said, you were you were an activist before getting involved in the political scene. So, can you tell us a little bit about that, like how you progressed to where you are now? Um, yeah, the evolution of my political career is is pretty interesting. I think that. Uh, Going back over a decade, as I got a little older, I realized that uh, there were some important issues going on for our, our community. Um, and I began uh, work at the Pride Center, uh, just going to different things and being part of meetings and, and learning uh, about what the issues were. Uh, and then when I went to retire, I was looking, I was actively looking for things to do and I think you'll remember the meeting that I was at when we uh, when yeah. we formulated the LGBTQI alliance, and I uh, foolishly raised my hand and said, "Keith, I'll help you." Uh, <laughs> it was it was actually a, a uh, pinnacle moment in in my direction where I was headed, and it wasn't very long after that that I was retired. I uh, started going up to the state house with Keith, and and activism is a blend of of politics and um, being able to be in the right place at the right time, uh, which I seem to have had some good luck with doing, uh, starting first with the, uh, the bathroom bill uh, and moving towards uh, the third gender on driver's licenses and IDs. Um, and it just kind of snowballed from there. I testified for a lot of bills across a lot of different uh, issues. Um, minimum wage being a strong one, um, healthcare being another. Um, we uh, uh, got kind of paused a little bit when I worked with Christine Hallquist to try to make her governor of, of the state of Vermont. And boy, oh boy, did that give me a, a crash course in campaigning and politics. And uh, I got to know many, many people made a huge amount of contacts that continued uh, after uh, the election was lost. In fact, that next day, um, I called uh, uh, the governor's office and my contact there uh, said, so can we get back to work now? And uh, it was very, very rewarding that he said, absolutely, let's schedule a meeting. So uh, we got right in to see the governor. And that's, I think, one of the hallmarks of the activism and the work that Keith and I did at the State House is we, we forged alliances uh, with uh, House leaders, with Senate leadership, with uh, executive leadership, uh, different departments like the Vermont HRC, uh, the Attorney General's office, um, and all these contacts remain close to me. We've been in tight communication because most mostly we have Democrats running for those offices again, and I think that's a that's a wonderful thing. Um, so I've, I've been very very pleased to be part of. Uh, really what's going to be a wave of Democrats taking over the state house. I certainly hope and across the country, I hope. I think, um, you know, the abortion 
uh, ban has really activated a lot of people who may not have been that interested to all of a sudden start getting interesting. At least that's my hope anyway. So I agree. I think it's going to be a good turnout at the polls. Uh, Vermonters should know everybody that's here in this that's in Vermont. Uh, you're all getting mailed uh, ballots by the end of September. Um, you have the opportunity to vote in less than four weeks. Uh, I think that's a, a key part of, of our rights and, and freedoms is to vote. So uh, regardless of who you vote for, I hope you get out and, and cast your ballot for your candidate of choice. But do some study and do some diligence and, and find out who your candidates are. Ask friends, ask people who are active uh, about their their stances and it would be a, a good thing to have a record turn up this uh, yes. this fall. So Brenda Churchill, we're rooting for you. And if we could vote for you, we would, but- Well, yeah. And we're looking forward to going to the celebration party after. It'll be big. And um, I'm absolutely certain that, uh, um, while you can't vote for me, you can contribute, go to my webpage and uh, read about me. And uh, hopefully we'll, We'll be able to have enough money to fund some postcards and get out and do some more contacts. And um, I think I owe you guys T-shirts. Isn't that isn't that yeah. right? <laughs> yes, but you know we can we we can wait. Um, and uh, but we'll we'll wear them on the show when we when we get them. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah. So Brenda, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate your activism and your hard work and diligence. And um, you've been a great friend and, and, and um, person working for all of us for a long time. So thank you. I appreciate that. And thanks to you and, and Keith and Ann uh, as well. Uh, it's been great knowing you and you're strong advocates and you keep people informed. I think that's a, that's a really important part of our community because um, people are taking information in so many different ways. But going on and looking at your podcast and your, your online presence, phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. So thank you for what you guys do as well. Well, thank you. And we will uh, talk to you before then, and hopefully you'll get into this area and we can meet up in person. So take care, uh, good luck, and be well. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Josie Levitt who is a well-known person around the state. Um, she moved here in 1996. This is uh, her second appearance on the show. When we talked three years ago, I learned that she's originally from New York City, that she got her BA at Columbia College and uh, a degree from Teachers College. Since she's been in Vermont, she's been part owner of the Flying Pig Bookstore and has been a comic and storyteller on the circuit for a while. But yes. now she has a new incarnation that we're uh -huh. here to discuss and celebrate. So welcome, Josie. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here again. Um, it's great to have you back. As people who are uh, in the know politically, already know, Josie is a candidate for state representative for the Grand Isle West Milton District. This is a new development in your life, but um, in our conversation before we taped, I learned that it's almost an outgrowth of your ongoing political activism. Yes. But may I ask you, when you were in New York, did you do anything uh, political? You know what's interesting? Now that I'm, you know, I'm working with Act Blue and there's a Take Action group, I am occasionally channeling my very early activist self, which was when I was working for ACTA as a volunteer and gay men's health crisis at the height of the AIDS crisis. So periodically I'm like, I need to talk to someone at ACT UP and no one gets it. And I'm just like, oh, sorry, wrong people, wrong decade. You, none of you are queer. You don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, yeah, it goes back a long time. And I, I didn't run for office in New York or anything, but I was definitely active politically because too many of my friends were dying. You know, and I, I was in, I was right. I graduated from college in 87 and sort of walked into the height of the AIDS crisis. And I was at Columbia and, you know, I just, friends of mine were just, I mean, just getting so sick and so many friends I knew died. And 
I mean, I lost every single male friend I had before 1991. And that was just, that was brutal. And just feeling that sort of powerless, I felt like I had to do something. So I started at Gay Men's Health Crisis as a volunteer, and then I would do ACT UP as well and sort of combine the two because I was doing direct volunteer service with Gay Men's Health Crisis because I was helping guys get hooked up with social security disability insurance. And I was walking them through the process and then ACT UP, we were just making a lot of noise and getting people to notice like people are dying, something big needs to happen and you all need to actually pay attention. And it's, it's not just gay people who are dying. It's a lot of marginalized people were clearly affected by the HIV and AIDS crisis. Um, and then I took a big long break. Um, you know, I, I moved to Vermont. Okay, I shouldn't take, I did take a huge break because my ex-wife and I moved to Charlotte. We opened the Flying Pig Bookstore. And then within two years, I was on the planning commission. And then, Charlotte. what in Charlotte, yeah. And um, I realized that really wasn't for me, but it took me four years to realize that because it was a four-year term and I thought, well, I'll stay. Um, and then I joined the rescue squad and I was on the rescue squad, the Charlotte Volunteer Rescue Squad for six years. And the last two, I was chief. Oh. Yeah, and that pretty much spoiled me for, I just, after being chief, I didn't want to do rescue anymore because it was just too many type A personalities. And I just, I found I didn't like it ultimately because I, I didn't get a lot of call volume. So, and I felt like I was waiting around for something to happen to my neighbors. And I started to really not enjoy that. And, um, and then I started teaching comedy. So I went from the sort of medical love that I have in my life to the creative love. And the minute I stopped doing rescue, comedy just flew out of me. So I needed, I needed to not have anything else to let my creative, creative life blossom again. And now I'm in Grand Isle and- um, You've been in Grand Isle five years. Five years. And um, I started going to development review board meetings um, over the um, last summer because the Lake Champlain transport, uh, transportation company, the, the ferry, you know, they're, they go out of Grand Isle and 24 hours a day to Plattsburgh, which is fine, but they wanted to build a 30,000 square foot maintenance facility, 275 feet away from where we pull our water. And I got really involved in that. And I saw how few people were involved in local boards. And then I started going to, to select board meetings and I was not happy with what I was seeing. And I had applied for an open spot on the select board. And I gave a killer interview. I thought I did great. And they picked a guy who had just lost the election for select board. And I thought, now this feels a little bit, now I'm not gonna say rigged, but a woman had stepped down, she had resigned and they replaced a woman's spot on the select board with a man who had just lost his fourth election in a row for select board, which tells me folks maybe didn't want him as a selectman. And I thought, well, this is bull. And so I decided I'm gonna run because I was, I was angry, I was pissed. And then I went to every single select board meeting from September until now. And I realized five people are making really big decisions and who's on your local boards really matters. Can you give me an example of some of the things that the select board decides? Well, one of the things they decided, and this was before me, and this is one of the things that made me decide to really run as well is Concerned citizens, as they say, um, there were 150 people put in a request for action, which is not the same thing as a petition, but they asked the select board to basically do three years to re-audit the audits for three years. And the select board agreed to it and they spent $60,000 to re-audit the audits. It wasn't a forensic audit. And we just spent $60,000 of taxpayer money to be told the audits are now basically done. Oh, by the way, your auditor didn't do anything wrong. Neither did your town clerk or your treasurer. Uh -huh. And I just thought, wow, there's where's the oversight? Where are, where are clearer heads? Why aren't they prevailing? And why are, and this town, I love my town, but, and it's like all towns, you know, there are factions. 
there aren't they aren't political. They're more sort of old time. Who, how, what families lived here for the longest? And oh, you know, you're new. And someone even on front porch forum said, you know, at that point, I only lived here four years. And someone put on front porch forum, we should mandate that you have to live here at least five years before you can run for office. And that was a direct dig in me. And I was like, you know, seriously, guys. And, you know, I'm running for office because no one else is. <laughs> and I, I won handily by like a two to one margin. So I feel pretty good about that. And the nice thing is the way the select board meets, we meet on Mondays, which are nights that I'll always be home should I win the state house. So I'm going to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to step off the select board. Um, and I'm getting asked that a lot when, when I door knock and people are very surprised that I'm going to do both. And I, I always answer with, I honor my commitments and my commitment is to my town. And now my commitment is to my town and also now to my county. Mm -hmm as a state rep and being on the select board will better inform me as a rep and I'll be able to bring back real concrete examples of issues that we're struggling with that we need Montpelier's help with that maybe we haven't had in the last two years because we haven't had reps who live on the island. And that leads me to my next question. How did you happen to throw your hat in the ring for state rep? Okay, I threw my hat in the ring. Um, very late because I didn't want to do it. I didn't think it was appropriate for me to do it, partly because I have only lived here five years. I'm, I'm on the select board. And I thought, you know, I, someone else should do it. I, I didn't, it's, it was it felt like hubris if I had done it. And I, I'm not that kind of person. And I, I didn't think I could. And I kept waiting, you know, the, the petition period. And I was checking almost every day with the town clerk going, has anyone put in a petition? And she said, no, no one. And then the, the petition period came and went and not one Democrat had their name on the ballot. So we, it was basically two Republicans and then nothing on the Democratic ballot. And I thought, well, that can't happen because democracy doesn't exist without choices. And I thought, all right, fine. So I started really thinking about it. And then I talked to my partner. And at first she was sort of like, please don't do this. Just don't do this. <laughs> Um, and then my sister-in-law, Tiffany Bloomley, is in the state house. Love her, a former guest on the show. She's great. Sorry about the dog. Um, stop barking, sweetie. And um, we can't hear her. Okay, good. Um, and I called Tiff. Actually, I called her later. That's not true. I called Missy Johnson first because she lives in South Hero. She was speaker, and I said walk me through, I said, what's it like being in the state house? Because honestly, and I'll be perfectly blunt, I was afraid I was going to be totally bored. Because I'm like, how many, like, how much change can I actually affect? And how much of my time am I going to be spent being frustrated, spending hours and hours a day in meetings? Because I don't particularly enjoy that. And she walked me through the whole legislative calendar. And I thought, okay, this sounds good. I can do this. And I said, you know, do I need to be in Montpelier? Do I need to stay over three nights a week? She said, no stay over one night, make it intentional. And then you can drive home. It's like, okay, that's good. Cause I, I didn't want to be away from home that many nights. And um, cause you know, I want to be with my partner. And then I just talked to a couple more people. I talked to Jill Kronowski, the speaker of the house and she was lovely. I talked to Mike McCarthy. Everyone really gave me a lot of time and a lot of information. And then it was what Keisha Rahm said when I reached out to her because we're friends. And I said, Keisha, what difference does one more Democrat make? And she explained about how many veto override votes we'd, we'd missed by one vote. And she also said one more Democrat is one less Republican taking up space in a committee room and slowing things down and making, and making it harder for us to reach our agenda. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then we ran, an, a, we ran a writing campaign and I had a lot of amazing help from this group we have out here called Take Action. And these folks were stunningly helpful. I don't think we would have been able to do it without them. And my partner's a graphic designer. So she, and, and Tiffany actually designed my, my lawn sign because she, one night after she found out I was going to run, we had this long talk about it. And um, the next day she sent me like five, no, like eight different versions of, of lawn signs <laughs> that she had designed and they were all great. And then my partner at least just tweaked one and it's wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. And you know, so people have been just really helpful 
People are very excited. And now we have choices. So Karen and I um, also, because Annie had to step out. There was a woman who was also on the writing campaign and she, we both won our nomination, obviously. And um, she, her, her boss said after she won, you know what? You can't do this. You, you can't be both. So she had to step step off and not accept the nomination. And then Karen Ames got the the, the second nomination um, through the committee work. And our names are on the ballot. And it's actually really cool because it's Karen Ames, Josie Levitt, Michael Morgan, Andy Parody. So we're the top two, which is nice. Um, <laughs> and man, does that matter? God, I hope not, but it might. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and I'm learning a lot and the Democratic Party has been enormously helpful. And there are a lot of people out here who have been, so I'm moved almost every day by how generous people are with their time and their, their talents. Uh, what's your platform? What are the what's, key points? Oh, the key points are, um, I'm totally in support of reproductive liberty. Um, I know, right? Mm -hmm. Seriously. Um, affordable housing. We need to see a lot more of that. We need to do something to mitigate climate change because Vermont is actually of all the New England states, the one that's the only one that's failing to meet the standards. I didn't know that. Yes, I, I, it's funny. I learned that in my VPIRG interview um, and VPIRG just endorsed me as a I'm candidate so yesterday, which was the very, as my first, I've never gotten endorsed before and I'm really happy that it's them. Um, and we talked about, the other thing is clean heat standard. And how do we help people who can't afford to do the things they need to do to make their home more energy efficient? How do we support that? And how, you know, I am also on the board and a volunteer at our local food shelf. And I see so many people who work, who have kids or who are seniors on a fixed income. And there, and also since March, when I started the number, our volume has doubled, literally doubled because inflation, um, gas prices, and now we're getting people who are very, they're terrified. And I asked a couple of people last week, I'm like, why do you all look so spooked? And this woman said, because we now we're thinking about how we're gonna, how we're gonna pay to heat our house. Because everyone knows that the heating oil is very, very expensive right now, and it's only gonna get worse. And they're trying to figure out how am I gonna do both? And people last year made choices of heat my home, or have dinner. Mm -hmm. And that should not be. Absolutely. And the other thing I really care about is how can we have paid family leave? How can we address the complete lack of childcare, affordable childcare in this state? And the flip side of that is how can we also pay childcare providers what they deserve? They, none of these people should be making minimum wage. They're taking care of children. That's the most important thing a person can do in a lot of ways is take care of someone else's child and help educate them. And they're getting $15 an hour. That's crazy. And I, you know, I'm reminded my old English teacher in high school said, you can tell what a society cares about by what they pay people. And as a teacher back then, he said, and this is not slighting sanitation workers at all, but he said the sanitation worker gets paid three times what he got paid as a teacher. And so people don't value education. And, and how do we make it affordable for families that came to Vermont during the pandemic? I mean, all, not all of them are wealthy, but how do we, and also how do we keep people in their houses? With just cause eviction now, people are losing their leases left and right for no reason. And there's no place for them to go. There is like the rental stock just in Grand Isle County is non-existent. The to to as far as I can tell, you know, it's like a house here, maybe a house here. And how do you then address the the investors who are buying up homes to turn them into Airbnbs? And we have a lot of those out here because this is a great Airbnb B place in the summer. And then what do you do when you take some of that housing stock? off the market and why are houses so expensive? And I have a dear friend who's a farmer out here. She's an organic farmer. She can't afford to build a house right now. She has some money and it went from being 300,000 
to build a house before COVID. Now it's like 650,000 to build a 1500 square foot house. She's like, I can't afford that. Who can afford that? So we need to address the inequities and we, we need to slow down some systems that are going way too fast. And we need to remember, especially in Grand Isle County, where the, we don't even have a bus. We have no public transportation out here. Mm-hmm. We have one bus in Alberg that goes Alberg to Swan. If you want to go on the bus in Grand Isle County, it takes two and a half hours to go to Burlington. And it's twice a day you get a shot at it. That's crazy. And that means you have to have a car. Which you, right. And so many problem. of my, my food shelf clients, you know, and I talk to them a lot and I'm just, you know, so like, how's it going? And everyone has said, I am one car repair away from being homeless. And then, you know, then they went and closed our courthouse for a long time during the pandemic. And then we had to really fight. And that's one thing that the previous select board did very, very well is they fought hard with Doug DeSabato, our state's attorney to keep our court, to get our courthouse back open because we need one here. We shouldn't always be asking people to go to St. Albans or Burlington, um, especially for for domestic violence cases where you need to file a relief from abuse order. Um, If someone's paying attention to how many miles you're putting on your car and they see, oh, why'd you go, why are there 75 miles on this car all of a sudden? Then, you know, it's just going to trigger more questions and more violence and more abuse. Um, So there, there are things... How can I say this? Grand Isle County is a unique county because we are the only county in Vermont that does not, it is the only landmass we're contiguous with is Canada. You, the only way you, you have to want to come to Grand Isle County. You don't just happen to drive through it on your way someplace else. It's an intentional thing, but because we don't connect to any other part of Vermont, we're often forgotten. Because people are like, what's Grand Isle County? We don't even, we're not even on the map drawn the right way. You know, if, if, if you look at state maps of Vermont, we should be a little island chain and we're connected and we're not. So anyway, that, that's one thing I, anyway. Um, so, you know, yes, go ahead. Let's step back and why'd you move to Grand Isle County? I'll, I'll give you the short version. Um, I moved to Grand Isle County because in 2018, I got breast cancer Mm -hmm. and I was in the middle of treatment and on my infusion weeks when I felt really bad and I wasn't at that time I was working at the pride center. Um, I was always off on infusion weeks and I was working from home, but I would spend time on Zillow looking at houses on the water because I, I, my partner and I had spent some time at different, different places on the water. And I just like, I really the water, being on the water relaxes me and it calm, it slows my very busy, busy brain down. And then this house popped up on Zillow and I thought, oh my God, I got to go look at this house. And I had started looking at other houses, you know, I started, well, what about this house or, you know, on Crystal Lake? And I was looking at different things and then this house popped up and everything about it, I just loved. And so in the middle of radiation, I bought a house because why not? Why not move in the middle of cancer treatment? Sure. Great (laughs) idea. And um, so that's how I came here. (laughs) Uh Well, you put beautiful pictures up on Facebook. You know, I I face east and I'm an early riser. And one of the things I I did two things with, with photography. The first was for the first, I guess maybe it was the second year that I lived here. Every morning at 717, I would take a picture from the same spot. So mm-hmm. you could see sort of how the sun tracked and how it was different. And then when COVID started, I took a sunrise picture every day for a year and a half because I just thought people needed it. And all I would say was Monday, Tuesday, because people were also like, what day is it? Know. You know, in the beginning of COVID, we're all just saying we're, 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 we're hemmed in. We're all just, you know, we're sort of locked down. And I thought, let's give somebody, let's give people something pretty to look at, and I found it very soothing. And so now I, I, if I have a particularly pretty day and I'm up early enough, I will take a picture just because it's beautiful. I know, and it is relaxing even for the viewer. I have a friend who lives in New Orleans on the bayou 
who does oh. the whole thing, you know, of storks and crocodiles, mm. and egrets and ducks. Well, that's lovely. I know it. It's really soothing for the uh, viewer. Here well, I've had people ask me now, like, are you going to make a card line or a calendar? Well, I, I don't have time. In, in, in another world, in another iteration of my life, maybe, but, um, but I enjoy it. And I know um, it gives so many people pleasure and people who are, you know, it's not about like how many likes am I getting? Because who, who cares? Right. Uh, but people I run into are like, oh my God, your picture today was beautiful. I'm like, cool. You know, I have no idea who's looking at them. Um, and it's, I just, I, I like doing that. And it's, if I can spread a little tiny bit of joy in a world that feels completely chaotic and on fire. And if you're queer, it feels starting to feel a little threatening. I would say. Uh, you know, um, I just, I'm trying to make it better. So that's partly why I'm running for office is to make sure that queer folk don't get, can I swear? Oh, sure that queer folk don't get shit on again. And mm -hmm. there's already enough violence. You know, there's such an uptick in hate crimes. We had some hate crimes out here on the right. islands where people were, were burning progress flags. So they almost took somebody's house down because they set the flag on fire and they were stealing flags. And I thought, this is really close to home. Yes. And yeah. this is heinous and hateful and there's no reason for this. So if I can be in the state house and work with people like Taylor Small and, and Tiff Bloomley and really work to protect the LGBTQ plus community in Vermont, sign me up. You know it. Um, so are you, as you continue on your journey, are you gonna still keep telling jokes and be a comic and storyteller? Yes, I am. I'm the funny thing is, you know, um, door knocking is, inherently it's it's really hard you know when you go and you you have your little pamphlets and you go and you knock on people's door because i can see them hiding behind a wall in their house where they think i can't see them i'm like there are three cars in the driveway there's a dog barking so clearly somebody's home um no one has a doorbell so the material what i'm trying to say is it's writing itself <laughs> yeah. my first day door knocking i got bitten by a dog i'm like awesome oh, no. this is great this is fun um but also again it's like when i went through cancer treatment going through something that's challenging and i find door knocking very difficult um but knowing i can talk about it later makes it easier because if i have a bad exchange with somebody i can write about it and then i did sort of discharge the bad feeling and try and find the good you know my my whole motto is you can have a shitty day or a funny day it's the same day, you know, it just depends on how you want to look at it. And, and the other, the, the cool thing about door knocking though, is when I actually get to talk to someone who's, who's nice and is, is kind enough to just want to talk to me. I, it's almost like I'm doing crowd work at a comedy show because I have to be really quick because sometimes they'll throw me a curveball of a question and I'll have to think you have to really think on your feet you have to be really quick and um and also i'm realizing if i can make somebody laugh about something about the 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 political climate or the the political scene they're going to remember me because every time you make somebody laugh and you have a shared laugh you've created a little tiny community even if it's just you and i laughing or a whole room people remember the laughter and if i can use that to my advantage as a politician, that can only help me. And I have several shows lined up. I'm doing a show uh, right after the election um, down in Bellows Falls. And then Emerge Vermont has asked me to do something after the election, just to sort of ev everybody get in a room and just relax. Like we're not campaigning, the election's over and just let's have some fun. Were you involved with Emerge in this? Yes, I was. Well, I, you know, I kind of, I missed the boat on Emerge training for running for state office because I didn't, wasn't, wasn't planning on it. But I did take, they, they had a great one-off workshop on how to run for select board. Uh -huh. And that was enormously helpful. And Elaine Haney, their, their director, um, 
I pretty much did everything she told me to do. And I ran, a, it was a good campaign. She was enormously, it was great. She really helped me. And I learned a lot about politics and how, how you run a campaign, which is a little bit like starting a comedy show in a way, like what are your component pieces? What's your plan sort of, what's your set list? And then how are you gonna bounce off of that? And how are you gonna be sort of flexible and spontaneous, but also stick to what you know you have to do? And another commonality I was thinking is that you have the, in both campaigning and in comedy, you have the opportunity for exchange. Yes, very much so. Because when you were last on the show, you said the difference between comedy and storytelling is that comedy, you have some back and forth with the audience where storytelling is more. Storytelling, is, right? you don't, you're not supposed to have. And I find that I'm, it's easier now for me than it used to be, but I still, I, I like that exchange. You know, and I think being a comic who really enjoys crowd work has made campaigning easier for me. You know, I mean, one guy, it was like the third door I knocked on and um, I knock, I knock again and it's the screen door I'm knocking on, you know, and then the, the other doors open. And I'm like, well, somebody's home because the front door is open, but you, you, you never open a door. You just don't do that. And out comes this, this man who's shirtless wearing kind of shorty shorts. And um, he's like, can I help you? I'm like, oh my God. And I was like, you are not my people. And I said, yes, my name's Josie Levin. I'm running for, for state house. He's like, I don't like politics. And I said, neither do I. And I immediately got his attention. He's like, what? And I said, nobody likes politics. And I said, but here's why I'm running. And that worked. That, that, and I, I don't think he's gonna vote for me. Cause I think he, you know, whatever he, he's a Republican, like very conservative Republican. And he said that, but he did take my materials and he said, you know what? Thank you for hanging in there with me. I was like, all right. And I said, thank you for letting me talk to you without, and I really appreciate that you didn't just slam the door in my face and you didn't just turn around and say, I don't like politics and just walk away. And so we had a, we wound up having a really great exchange and I'll take that for a win. You know it. Well, yeah, we love it. This has been delightful. We yes, wish you and thank you so much. I love talking to you. It's so much fun. I did hope. Yeah, the feeling is mutual, and I hope you win. And uh, thank you. Back. Me come too. Back. And talk. yes, all right, Josie Levitt, vote for her. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>